computer. Ωραία. Ε, I will start speaking in English now and uh, we are really exciting. Okay, got it. We are really excited uh, to have uh, John Antoniadis with us, even virtually today. Uh, John Antoniadis um, has obtained his PhD degree in astrophysics from the University of Bonn in 2013. And then he worked as a Dunlop Fellow at the University of Toronto in Canada before moving again back to Bonn in 2017, where he worked as a, a, where he became scientific staff at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy and also lecturer at the University of Bonn. Uh, after that, in 2020, also uh, amidst the pandemic, he joined the newly founded, founded Institute of Astrophysics in Crete, which is called FORTH, and now he's uh, working as a scientific staff there. He's also the leader of the Stellar Afterlife and Transients Group, and this is a, a group that is being funded by the European Commission and also the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. So John Adoniadis is a very uh, well-known radio astronomer, but also uh, he has several interests, including um, astrophysical transients, compact, uh, compact objects, and gravitational wave sources. He has also worked uh, in pulsar timing arrays, and I believe that his favorite topic uh, are pulsars. So today he will be talking about a, a new project which has been recently funded, and it's like a large scale project that will take place uh, in Greece. Um, it's called Argos, and we are really excited to hear about uh, Argos more. And I think this is the first time that you're going to talk about it, right? So we are really honored. <laughs> Indeed, it is, yes. So uh, thank you very so much, thank John. You. So the, the pleasure is all mine and thank you very much for the very kind uh, introduction, very humbling uh, introduction, Maria. And thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining. Uh, well, I, as I said, I hope you can hear me. I'm going through a cold, so um, my voice is not, I'm not actually in, you know, in 100% performance mode. Uh, but anyways, I will try. Uh, so just to get a sense, uh, how many uh, students are in the in the audience? I can recognize a few names of uh, students. So I think uh, the majority. <laughs> okay, so that's that's good. Uh, okay, so I will. Uh, okay, so the, the talk will be about Argos, which is the project that we started implemented uh, implementing very recently uh, here at Fourth. It's actually a European project, so not only Fourth. Uh, so here's an overview of my talk. So first I will say a few things about the uh, scientific motivation and the background. So why do we need an instrument uh, such as Argos? Uh, and then I will talk about the project that is uh, actually being implemented right now. So the Argos conceptual design study. And then at the end, I will try to conclude on some ideas of how uh, you can get involved uh, if you like to. Uh, and let's see if I can, if my estimates here are correct. I will try. So uh, since there are a lot of students uh, in the audience, I want to start with the briefest possible uh, uh, overview of the history of observational astronomy. Um, so, you know, at the beginning there was nothing and then at some point there were humans and for the most most time of uh, human history, the only instrument that we had to observe the sky was the uh, our eyes, so human vision. And uh, human vision is not such uh, a bad instrument to observe. Uh, it's not such a bad uh, astronomical instrument if you think about it. It has a very uh, wide field of view and uh, using our eyes, we are able to you know, detect transient phenomena on the sky as soon as they occur. So comets, uh, supernovae, uh, planets, and so on and so forth. So most of, for most of the history of humanity, uh, the human eye was the only observational instrument that we had to um, observe and study uh, the sky. Now, obviously, uh, at some point, we hit the fundamental uh, limitation, uh, which is the low sensitivity of human vision. So uh, our eyes are relatively small, so we're not able to detect, uh, you know, faint uh, phenomena uh, on the sky. 
So that problem obviously was solved with the invention of the, of the telescope. And so Galileo, um, Galileo used the um, telescope in the, in the 1600s for the first time to observe the sky. And because telescopes, we can build telescopes that have much larger collecting areas compared to um, our eyes, we then um, became capable of observing even fainter phenomena in the sky. And that allowed the whole range of, you know, a broad range of discoveries, obviously, and uh, transformed uh, the history of science. Uh, so some, at some point, uh, about, uh, let's say, 100 years ago or so, for the 100 years ago, wh whereas for most of the history of telescopes, we only had telescopes uh, that were able to detect uh, visible light, we then eventually uh, managed to apply the same techniques to other wavelengths. So now we have telescopes uh, that can observe gamma rays, uh, X-rays, all the way up to, to radio wavelengths. And that also allowed a very broad range of, of new um, uh, discoveries. So now I want to argue that we are in a very interesting uh, turning point uh, in our history. Uh, where we can com basically combine uh, the benefits of these two observing techniques. So the wide field and the high speed and dexterity of, of human vision with the high sensitivity of, of telescope. And that we can do now basically thanks to advances say, uh, in technology. So in the past 10 years or so, maybe 20 years, we started building instruments uh, that basically can observe the entire sky at all times, both with high speed and with high sensitivity. So this is a um, this is a sky uh, this is a sky map uh, produced. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, with Fermi. So Fermi is a satellite uh, that detects uh, a gamma rays. So uh, the image that you see here is, uh, uh, is a gamma ray map uh, of the sky. So this is a Milky Way and all the points that you see here are not stars, but they are high energy uh, compact objects. So either pulsars or uh, AGN. Uh, so we can also do this at other wavelengths. So this is another example, uh, Erosita. Erosita is a an X-ray satellite, again, all sky, all the time uh, uh, satellite uh, that is detecting X-rays. And by doing this, um, uh, we can study phenomena such as you know, uh, accreting uh, compact objects, uh, very high energy phenomena, and so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, at optical um, wavelengths, we have lots and lots of uh, uh, all sky panoptic surveys. So Gaia is just uh, one example. And of course, uh, you know, the University of Athens is, is heavily involved in, in Gaia. So I don't have to talk uh, uh, about that uh, a lot. So you all know about Gaia, but you know, there are also other instruments, um, LSST, uh, things like Kepler that is looking for, for transients, again, wide field instruments, high sensitivity instruments uh, that allow uh, a broad range of scientific uh, inquiry. Uh, is everything clear so far? Right, I hope so. Uh, so now importantly, we cannot only do this uh, with uh, electromagnetic radiation, uh, but we can now also do this with multiple messengers. So obviously you all know about LIGO and Virgo. Uh, LIGO is a gravitational wave interferometer that observes the entire sky, uh, searching the entire sky for gravitational waves. LIGO made uh, its first discovery in 2015. And since then, uh, it has detected um, of order a few, uh, uh, a few tens of, of uh, gravitational wave events. And these events from the entire sky, and these events have completely changed our view of how you know, massive, stars die and how compact objects uh, form and evolve. So just to give you an idea, this uh, the masses of uh, neutron stars and black holes in our galaxy obtained through 
electromagnetic uh, measurements, so pul uh, pulsar timing basically and uh, X-ray observations. And these are the systems uh, that we have observed with uh, LIGO. So completely different picture, complementary picture that uh, gives us a new uh, <clears throat> new insights into the formation of this of these objects. So okay, now uh, unfortunately, uh, not everyone is participating in this party uh, yet. Uh, so not everyone can um, can contribute to this uh, revolution. Uh, for instance, uh, you know our cosmic ray colleagues are just getting ready to discover the moon. So this is a, you know, a two sigma detection of the moon in in, um, in cosmic rays, and I'm not you know I'm not making fun of cosmic ray astronomy. I'm just uh, merely pointing out that there are in some cases there are both fundamental and significant fundamental and, and technological limitations that do not allow this full sky exploration of the sky at uh, this with these messengers and at all wavelengths. And this also applies, unfortunately, to radio astronomy. So radio astronomy deals with uh, radio emission with very long wavelengths, so from millimeters to a few tens of, of meters. And uh, there are some fundamental limitations because of these very long wavelengths of, uh, of radio waves that do not allow this, um, uh, uh, or have not, do not, make it easy to do a panoptic uh, radio survey of the sky. Uh, so what would be the requirements to uh, uh, do a panoptic radio survey? So first of all, you need uh, something with a large field of view, right? Uh, then you also need uh, high sensitivity and high resolution. So here lies the problem. If you think about a single dish radio telescope, so this is a a typical radio telescope is the Effelsberg uh, telescope in, in Bonn. It's a single dish radio telescope. It's the largest one in Europe, uh, second largest fully steerable telescope uh, in the world, only seconded by the Green Bank uh, radio telescope in West Virginia. Uh, and the diameter of the dish here is 100 meters. Uh, even though this is a huge, you know, a huge disk, the resolution at typical observing wavelengths is only about, you know, a quarter of the size of the moon. So orders of magnitude uh, worse than what we can do with uh, optical, basically backyard optical telescopes. And that is because of the long wavelengths of light. And also, you know, uh, on the one hand, you want, if you want, you know, to be sensitive to signals coming from across the entire sky, you actually need uh, your telescope to be small because the smaller the telescope is, the larger the field of view. But also if you want high sensitivity, then you need your telescope to be large. And also if you need high resolution, you also need your telescope to be large. And this is a, a, you know, a fundamental limitation. You cannot basically combine, build an instrument, a single dish instrument that can have all these attributes at the same time. Uh, so this is also demonstrated in this plot here that uh, shows the uh, sensitivity and the, uh, let's say, not field of view, but the, um, um, okay, let's say field of view. It's not exactly the field of view of these instruments. And uh, here is this fundamental barrier. So, you know, on the one hand, you have instruments. So here, small, uh, smaller is better, and here, larger is better, okay? So on the one hand, you have large telescopes with uh, high sensitivity, but small field of view. And on the other hand, you have small telescopes with large field of view, uh, but small sensitivity. So if we want to push to, th to this uh, area here uh, to enable a panoptic radio uh, sky survey, uh, then we have to, to think of something else. So, okay, now there is a, um, there's a fortunate side effect uh, uh, that has to do with this particle wave duality of, of light. Because radio waves uh, have very long wavelengths, uh, our instruments observe them as, as waves, basically. And that means in contrast to uh, 
um, visual detectors or high energy detectors that uh, detect light incoherently, so only the intensity uh, and polarization of light, radio telescopes can detect uh, signals coherently. That means that they can also record the phase uh, of the waves. And that enables a technique uh, that is called uh, radio interferometry. Unfortunately, I won't have time to, to go into the technical details of radio interferometry. But in just uh, one line is basically the, the uh, let's say, the science or, well, or, or the art, depending on, on who you ask, of, you know, using or maybe also altering the phases of the detected uh, signals uh, to coherently combine the, uh, the signals received uh, from different telescopes. Uh, so using radio interferometry, you can combine the signals from different telescopes to form a coherent instrument, a coherent signal that first uh, has the field of view uh, that is determined by the aperture of each individual element. So if the elements are small, then the field of view can be large. Uh, the resolution is determined by the distance between uh, the different antennas. So the larger the distance between the antennas, the higher the resolution. And the sensitivity is determined by the number, the, the total collecting area of the instrument. So basically the number of uh, elements that you have in your array. So this the radio interferometry, and because we can uh, detect uh, light coherently, we can break this fundamental uh, degeneracy that is inherent to single disk uh, radio telescopes. So uh, in a nutshell, this is the idea behind uh, Argos. So if, uh, if you build an instrument uh, with small, that is composed of small dishes that have large fields of view, field of view, uh, you can basically uh, build an instrument that has both a wide field of view, high resolution, and high sensitivity. So this cartoon here sort of uh, demonstrates uh, this technique. So the, uh, okay, uh, some, uh, just opening a parenthesis for a minor technical uh, details. So the main, just for the radio astronomers in the, in, the, in the audience, the main fundamental observable in radio astronomy are visibilities. So these are products uh, that are formed by correlating the signals between each pair of elements in the, in the array. And so these visibilities here, by doing a Fourier transform uh, on, the, on this UV, it's called UV plane, so the visibility plane, uh, you can form a, an image of the, of the source that you observe on the sky, right? So the more telescopes you have, uh, the better you can feel this uh, UV plane and the better your images become. So in this cartoon here, the UV plane is uh, filled by having a few elements and allowing the earth to, to rotate. So this uh, arcs here um, uh, basically correspond to the rotation of the earth. So as the, uh, as the earth rotates so the effective distance between each pairs of elements on the sky also changes, right? Uh, now in principle, if you, increase the number of telescopes uh, sufficiently, then you don't have to wait for the Earth to rotate. You can take snaps of the images of the sky, and this is the idea behind uh, um, the so-called uh, big N, uh, small d interferometer. So N stands for the number of elements, and D stands for uh, 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 the, uh, the size of the, of the, small, of the, of, of the antennas. Everything clear so far? Feel free to interrupt me, by the way. Um, okay, so uh, so it's not, so there's a reason why this has not been done uh, yet. And that reason has to do with the computational complexity of this, um, of, of this uh, process. So interferometry is a very com a computationally heavy, um, Exercise. So, just to give you an idea, so the best uh, interferometer that we have uh, now, which you know consists of a few hundred uh, elements, uh, needs a correlator. So, uh, uh, 
a high performance computing unit to process uh, its data that is capable of, I'm sorry, of uh, processing a bandwidth that is several times larger than the bandwidth of the entire global internet. And as you can imagine, this is only now becoming possible due to advances in computing technology. Now we have very, uh, uh, you know, um, um, high performing uh, GPUs and FPGA. So gaming cards basically is what essentially allow us to do this now. But on the other hand, this is also a very expensive uh, experiment, right? It, it takes a lot of uh, power, a lot of energy, uh, and a lot of effort. And that also translates to uh, a lot of uh, you know, emissions, basically. So we don't want to, to, to do that. Uh, but in any case, so by because exactly there are these advances now in, in technology, so our um, computing resources become both more powerful and more efficiently efficient, we, uh, we can actually start doing this uh, type of experiments now uh, at a relatively uh, low cost. So, okay, time to introduce Argo. So this is basically a high level overview, a high level cartoon of, of Argo. So what is Argo? Argo is a concept for a radio camera, uh, all sky survey, radio uh, telescope uh, survey. Um, so Argos is a concept that uh, of you know basically an instrument that consists of uh, several thousand small dishes, six meter dishes distributed over a baselines of a few kilometers. Uh, the dishes are connected to a digital backend that takes care of all the processing uh, that is uh, located centrally in a, uh, uh, in a single um, uh, room. And what this backend does is that it takes all the signals, it correlates them, and then it produces science-ready data that then can be served to the uh, scientific community uh, as soon as the, uh, as the processing is finished. Uh, some uh, technical details about the concept. So currently, we're thinking about something like a, a thousand or 40,000 six-meter antennas. And uh, that translates to a significant uh, collecting area though. So that's uh, nearly equivalent to a 500 meter dish, I believe. And so the instantaneous field of view is about uh, 10 square degrees. Again, for the radio astronomers in the audience, the system temperature using uncooled receivers is about uh, 35K. So that's the requirement uh, right now. A requirement for aperture efficiency is about uh, 70 um, uh, 70 percent uh, the resolution at least for the candidate observatory sites that we're currently monitoring uh, can be about 10 arc seconds or it can be even better if we uh, manage to get longer baselines somehow and the frequency coverage is one to three gigahertz so uh, it's a broadband uh, instrument on the one hand, but it only targets one single frequency. Uh, and then the rest I will not uh, probably too technical to, to explain, but just to say that it's, a, you know, this can be an extremely sensitive instrument uh, uh, that can also serve the sky with very uh, high sensitivity. Uh, so there are some benefits associated to this concept, this design, and the, there are five, uh, basically there are five main benefits. Uh, modularity, scalability, low cost, uh, sustainability, and uh, complementarity to other facilities. Uh, so let me just briefly discuss uh, some of them. So what do we mean by modularity? Modularity means, so this is a, Again, a very high level overview of the signal chain of the instrument. So the, the antennas are here. So the ADCs are the analog to digital converters that basically feed the signal from the DCs to, um, uh, to the correlator. And so the, then the products of the multi, you can have multiple copies 
of the main data product, which is these visibilities, the, the data product of the correlators. Uh, so multiple copies of this uh, product can be distributed to different uh, science modules that can treat this uh, uh, product in different ways to address different scientific questions. For instance, you can send one copy to a module or, or a backend that takes care of faster timing, so it forms coherent beams on the sky um, to do pulsar timing. Uh, you can have another module that is looking, uh, does uh, commensal searches for fast radio bursts and uh, time domain uh, transients, basically. Uh, you can have another uh, thing that takes the visibility and forms images. And then if a new science question, um, uh, if there's an emerging science question, if there's some new idea, you can simply add another module uh, to your system without affecting um, anything else. For instance, if you want to look for aliens, uh, techn techno signatures, you can add uh, a module for that. If you want to do, let's say, a high resolution spectra, you can add the module for that, or uh, things like, you know, you can look for a very high energy, uh, cosmic rays hitting the moon, you can add the module for that and so on and so forth. And then the products of this uh, uh, of these pipelines can then be served to the scientific community uh, in basically real time. So uh, this is about modularity. So what about scalability and low cost? Uh, so basically the low cost has to do with the fact that uh, the design that we have in mind relies mostly on fully developed commercial of the self components. Uh, so these are small dishes. You can basically, there are companies that build them uh, for satellite uh, communication. Uh, you can basically buy them even on Amazon. Uh, same goes for the uh, gaming cards, so the GPUs and FPGAs that are needed for the, for the correlators. So almost everything in the signal chain, almost everything, not everything, can be basically purchased uh, off the shelf. And that reduces significantly both the development cost um, and the implementation cost. Uh, so, and that means basically that you can build an instrument that has the same sensitivity as basically the SKA uh, with uh, just one hundredth of the cost. But again, not doing the entire science of the SKA, but only targeting this specific uh, wavelength. And so, so something complementary to SKA. And so scalab uh, scalability then again uh, means that you can basically, uh, uh, the, the system can be scaled almost trivially uh, from two antennas to anything to uh, a few thousand antennas. So as you, you know, get more funding or get more money or as you ha have more um, uh, partners uh, joining uh, the consortium, you can just keep adding antennas and, and components to your uh, to your to your system, and the scaling is also uh, is almost uh, linear. Not not exactly linear, but uh, it can be. Uh, so the system can be designed in such a way that the scaling is is nearly uh, linear, and that is you know also makes it appealing for uh, us here in Greece because uh, you know the the, the funding uh, uh, landscape is uh, is. Um, well, it is what it is, so we have to work with that. But so by having an instrument that you know you can start building with a very small uh, uh, quaint, uh, quando funding is is very compelling for for um, um, our you know our ecosystem. Let's say. So now complementarity to other facilities. Uh, so both uh, that uh, has to do both with the wavelength coverage. So the wavelength coverage is. Uh, complementary to other uh, initiatives uh, to build uh, radio cameras, such as the DSA 2000 in uh, in the US, in California. Uh, so on the one hand, we'll have an instrument uh, with um, that provides a wavelength coverage that is very complementary to these other radio instruments, and also uh, is a valuable counterpart to other um, instruments, such as the LSST, for example. 
then uh, another uh, component uh, related to the complementarity is the fact uh, is the location. So hopefully we can build this somewhere in Greece, well, somewhere in Europe, ideally in Greece, even more ideally in Crete, but uh, that's you know up in the air. It's not uh, everything is fluent um, uh, now, but that uh, would allow us to have to access both part, at least part of the SKE uh, sky. So then we can do dedicated by having a dedicated high sensitivity instrument um, that is actually necessary. Uh, to follow up uh, SKA discovery. So Argos would uh, feel this need, uh, exactly feel this need. And then because of it, its location in Europe, um, it, it would allow, enable interesting synergies with uh, similar instruments in the US and maybe uh, in Asia. Uh, for instance, you can do interesting uh, things about, you know, related to the continuous coverage, uh, continuous monitoring of of transients and also enable um, unique experiments that are not um, um, we are not able to do now. For instance, look for FRB lensing and do high precision cosmology. So I will talk about a few of this uh, a bit later. Uh, okay, so a few things about the science uh, that we want to do with uh, uh, Argos. Uh, as I said, uh, in the original concept, uh, we're thinking about three modules, uh, three science backends, uh, basically. One backend will be doing pulsar timing. So, uh, uh, so pulsar timing, uh, so pulsars are neutron stars, uh, highly, uh, you know, highly magnetized neutron stars that allow us to do a broad range of, uh, of experiments. So with Argos, we would be able to perform daily timing observations of, uh, of order a few tenths of uh, the most precise clock-like pulsars uh, on the sky. And I will talk a bit about that in the next uh, slide. And also to follow up on SKA discoveries and do you know, pulsar timing for fundamental physics on so measuring masses, uh, doing tests of general relativity and so on and so forth. And also look for um, basically real-time search for glitches, uh, giant pulses, uh, magnetar outbursts and so on and so forth. So for pulsar timing array science in particular, so we can, so just a, um, a one line description of what pulsar timing arrays are. So basically we can treat, so pulsars, because they rotate very fast, if they rotate fast enough, we can treat them as, as clocks. Um, so the most precise, clock-like pulsars that we know in the galaxy, we can treat them as the arms of a galactic scale interferometer. And we can use the times of arrival of the pulses from these pulsars uh, to look for low frequency gravitational waves. So gravitational waves that have wavelengths of order, you know, uh, larger than the, um, than the size of the solar system. And what is emitting at these frequencies? Uh, so the main signal that we expect is uh, supermassive uh, black hole binaries uh, merging in the center of galaxies. So this is a key prediction of uh, hierarchical structural formation uh, models, but there can also be other signals, anything ranging from dark matter to inflationary signals from, from the early universe. Um, so right now, uh, this is sort of the sensitivity curve um, that we are uh, of current experiments. So the EPTA stands for the European Pulsar Timing Array. So this is an experiment that uh, uh, I also participate. It's a European uh, effort to detect these gravitational waves. And you see here with Argos, within five years, we'll be able to push the sensitivity of the EPTA by more than two orders of magnitude, and that will eventually allow us to detect both single sources on the sky and uh, also characterize the contributions, the different contributions uh, to the stochastic gravitational wave background. And another thing that you can see here is that not only you, know, you push the sensitivity, you increase the sensitivity uh, of this uh, PTA experiment, but also you increase the frequency coverage. So the high frequency, uh, uh, 
the, the response of the instrument, the high frequency response is determined by the cadence of the observations. So now th these are experiments that you know go on for a few tens of uh, a few decades basically, and the typical observing cadence is a few is basically of order a month. So by being able to do by having a dedicated instrument that is capable of doing these observations daily, then you can also basically do not only nanohertz gravitational wave astronomy but also push this limit to uh, the microhertz uh, gravitational waves and you know bridge the divide between LISA and uh, PTAs. Uh, how much time do I have? You have, have enough time? Uh, I think, 15 minutes because we started 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, I think I will manage. Uh, okay, another thing is multi messenger astrophysics. Um, you know, gravitational wave mergers, some of them emit electromagnetic waves. We know of just uh, one example uh, thus far. That was a double neutral star measure that was first detected by LIGO, and then there was a gravitational wave, uh, sorry, um, a, a gamma ray burst that was uh, detected by Fermi, and then the, uh, the EM counterpart of the, of the measure was basically detected across the entire electromagnetic uh, spectrum. I think most of us know the story already. So with an instrument such as, uh, uh, so radio waves in this case uh, come originate from the interaction of the ejecta from the merger uh, with uh, the interstellar medium. So depending on the different scenarios, that you, you can have different type of uh, light curve evolution, different types of, of radiation. Uh, just to make the long story short, with an instrument such as uh, Argos, one would be able to probe the entire uh, LIGO Virgo Cagra uh, horizon. Um, and observe the radio emission from this uh, double neutral star measures. <clears throat> so uh, similarly, imaging and slow transient. So imaging, uh, meaning um, Argus would also be able to do daily, provide daily uh, full stokes monitoring of more than a thousand uh, square degrees on the sky. And that translates to the daily detection of millions of AGN, supernovae, gamma ray bursts, X ray binaries, uh, uh, whatever science in the uh, radio waves, um, then uh, Argos would be able to, uh, and is within the, uh, inside the uh, Argos uh, sky, Argos uh, will be able to, to monitor um, with very high cadence. And in addition to that, we can also build, uh, you know, high sensitivity images of the sky. So by adding all these different uh, images taken daily, we can reach a sensitivity of you know, this orders of magnitude better than what is available now. And again, that makes uh, and that makes Argos a very valuable counterpart to. Uh, next generation uh, service such as the LSST that will also you know, push uh, the sensitivity of optical transient uh, surveys, uh, uh, increase the sensitivity by orders of magnitude. So fast radio bursts. Uh, so fast radio bursts are an interesting phenomenon. Uh, basically, we, we don't actually know what they are. They are brief. Uh, bursts of uh, radiation of uh, radio waves uh, that we know originate, most of them originate from uh, outside the galaxy. And now we know that they're very bright. So basically we can observe them across the, basically the entire universe. Uh, so we don't exactly know what is causing them, but they must be related to some type of coherent emission from, from neutron stars or magnetars or uh, something like that. Uh, so now Argos, um, if you want to detect and localize this fast radio burst, you exactly need an instrument with both high uh, field of view and, um, and uh, high resolution. So by combining these two attributes, uh, Argos will be able to detect and localize thousands of uh, FRBs per, uh, per year. And um, that will not only allow us to you know, probe the nature of FRBs, but also allow us to use them as tools to do precision cosmology. 
So FRBs have an interesting observational property. They're very brief. Uh, uh, so they're very brief pulses, right? So you can, again, treat them as, as a time signal. So, and they also come from very far away. So if there's some intervening uh, blob of matter between us and the FRB, then that can cause lensing. And lensing can cause two or multiple, uh, the creation of multiple images of the FRB that arrive at us at different, different times. So depending on the size of these uh, matter distributions, we can have delay times uh, ranging from uh, a few milliseconds, basically, to a few days. Uh, so if you have an instrument with a high resolution, you can probe uh, these uh, very small time delays. And then on the other hand, if you have two instruments, such as D uh, DSA 2000 and Argos uh, working together, then you can probe the entire range of this, uh, uh, of this lensing uh, time scales. And that translate to very high precision cosmology. So just to give you an idea, just by detecting a couple of these uh, lensed uh, FRBs uh, with uh, DSA and, and Argos, so just two of them uh, would give you an order of magnitude improvement in the measurement of the of the Hubble constant. You can basically observe, you know, the the universe expanding in real time uh, using FRBs. Okay, I'm moving on to the final part uh, of the talk. Uh, uh, so let me say a few things about the Argos conceptual design study, which is the project that we are implementing right now. So Argos uh, CDS, as we call it, is a horizon funded uh, design study, as the name suggests, uh, that aims to produce a fully costed design and also uh, uh, some technology demonstrators for the, for the project. So the main partners in the Argos Consortium are the uh, uh, fourth, so the Foundation for Research and Technology, HELAS, and fourth participates with two uh, institutes, the Institute of uh, Astrophysics, so that's us, and also the Institute of Computer Science, and uh, the Institute of Computer Science um, actually participates with two labs. Uh, one is the Signal Processing Lab, and the other one is the telecommunications networks uh, lab. Uh, then there's the signal processing lab of the University of Piraeus that is also participating. Uh, then we have the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy, you know, the usual suspects, and uh, the CEA Institute in, in France, uh, as I claim. So, so some of the phases of the consortium, uh, apologies to, um, this is, significantly out of date so there are more of us now and apologies to those in the audience that are you know not included in this uh, but uh, just to say that you know this is a very uh, interdisciplinary consortium so we have experts um, astrophysics experts signal processing experts uh, big data scientists um, uh, radio frequency engineers telecommunication engineers, uh, a lot of people from different backgrounds uh, that are needed to put this project together. Uh, so as I said, the concept for this conceptual design study is a, this is a three-year project uh, and the main deliverable of the project is a uh, detailed technical design study and the technology demonstrator. And that will include uh, both uh, um, anything from you know, quantitative cost to benefit analysis, scientific impact assessments, uh, socioeconomic uh, impact assessments, and also we want to produce cutting edge science uh, and uh, big data technologies as well, uh, as we design this instrument. Uh, so Argo CDS basically combines efforts on four fronts, uh, astrophysics, uh, engineering, uh, big data, and uh, community groundwork, and all this is integrated with uh, systems engineering. Uh, methodology. Uh, so what is uh, systems engineering uh, in the context of Argos? So systems engineering is a, is, you know, is a formal, strict methodology that manages the entire life cycle of, of, uh, of a system, of a project. So in the context of Argos, this means that uh, we want to go from the initial concept 
uh, which is what we have now. So this is a high level concept of what we want to build. And we have a few different ideas, few alternatives of how we want to achieve this or what we want to achieve. So many different options. And we want to uh, you know, formulate these uh, options, the science requirements, uh, uh, translate them into different um, system requirements uh, for these different options. And then we want to get the input from the science community uh, through a stakeholders workshop that will happen sometime this year. And we want to present these options to the community, get input from the community by, and by using this information, narrow down, uh, you know, um, and narrow down the different uh, options to two or three candidate designs. Now we want to develop these designs uh, for a bit uh, in, in, uh, in a bit more detail and then go through a preliminary design review where you know, an external committee reviews these designs. And then through this process, we adopt the baseline technology and then we uh, develop this baseline technology until the end of this conceptual design study. And we end uh, the study uh, with a so-called de detailed design review where we basically have to demonstrate that uh, the design and the technologies and everything that needs to be put together to build this telescope can actually work. Um, so uh, the um, the work is divided in nine work packages. Uh, okay, management is a kind of you know the typical umbrella um, work package that oversees the, the project. Uh, then we have uh, a work package that is uh, related to the science. So we do things like you know, simulations, population synthesis simulations, uh, imaging simulations, uh, mock data, produce mock data uh, for the different setups and, and so on and so forth. So anything that has to do with the science of the instrument goes into this work package. Uh, then we have the uh, system design uh, management work package. So this is kind of the umbrella uh, engineering work package that oversees all the engineering effort. Uh, we have activities related to site characterization. So we have a, a few candidate uh, sites where we could potentially deploy uh, this instrument. Uh, most of them are in Crete, but uh, some of them are also in you know, mainland Greece and also in Europe. So throughout these three years, we want to do detailed RFI monitoring of the sites and also investigate you know, the legal framework uh, uh, that um, would allow us to deploy this, uh, to, to select the best pos possible site uh, to deploy this instrument. Then the front end uh, subsystem design, so anything that has to do with the analog part of signal chain, so the receivers, the feeds, and so on and so forth. Um, the back end subsystem work package, so that has to do with uh, uh, the correlator, basically, and the digital uh, signal processing. Uh, the signal processing subsystem, again, that has to do with, uh, you know, building all the uh, technology and the algorithms that are needed to deliver the science, transform this basic raw products into science-ready uh, data for the community. And then we have this archiving and alert subsystem where basically this is the framework that manages the, um, the big data framework that manages the uh, the database and the um, user interface of the of the uh, of the experiment, and then we also have uh, dissemination, exploitation, communication activities. We're building uh, a Lego Argus, for instance, where we have um, small Lego antennas. Uh, we put them on a on a on a frame. We have a, a like a a camera um, reading the position of the of the um, of the Lego antennas, and then depending on the number of uh, and the size, the number and the configuration of the antennas, you can reproduce uh, an image on the uh, um, simulate the reproduction of an image uh, from the array. So things like that. Uh, so this is how we interact with uh, each other. The interface between the work packages. Basically, we have the science working group and the engineering working group. So the scientists basically ask and the engineers uh, provide. And 
I must say not everyone in the consortium likes this joke, but uh, we keep making it. Anyways, so, and then uh, we are also in the process of forming an advisory board. Um, we have the Argo stakeholders, which is basically everyone who that can be affected both positively and negatively from this project. So not only scientists, but, you know, um, vendors, uh, funding and policy bodies, uh, the, you know, uh, the public and so on and so forth. And we want to have a good representation of all these different types of stakeholders in the advisory board. Uh, now, in the context of this uh, conceptual design study, uh, we will also build uh, a, a prototype, so a, a small scale version of the instrument that will consist of 16 uh, six meter dishes. So the prototype will be installed uh, at Skinakas. And uh, the main purpose of the instrument will be to act as a technology demonstrator uh, for the conceptual design study of the full scale instrument. Now, <clears throat> Uh, having said that, this will be something like a 30 meter equivalent uh, telescope, this, so we can actually do some science with that. And we can do, actually, we can do most of the science that we will be able to do with Argos, but, but with lower sensitivity and uh, lower resolution, of course. So th these things include uh, things like in high uh, cadence uh, pulsar timing, a fast radio burst uh, detection and monitoring, uh, magnetar outbursts, uh, and synergies with Turbo. Turbo is a wide field optical instrument that is currently being installed uh, at Skinak as well, uh, that is um, funded through NSF. So the PI is Pat Kelly from the University of Minnesota. So by using these two instruments uh, together, we can actually follow up gravitational wave events uh, for FRB-like emissions. So there are some there are some claims that FRB emission has been detected uh, from uh, kilonovi, some kilonovi. Uh, so we will be able to actually detect this hypothesis using the prototype and not the full scale instrument. And also we want to do uh, technology path uh, finding both for Argos, but also for the SKA. Uh, so just to give you an idea about the science, here is again this uh, PTA sensitivity curve that I showed before. Uh, but now for, for the Pathfinder, so even with the Pathfinder, within uh, five years, we will be able to you know, push the sensitivity of the of PTAs by almost an order of magnitude, and also, again, increase the frequency coverage of, of PTAs. Um, so uh, what about technology pathfinding? Uh, some of the interesting things that we are um, currently investigating. Uh, uh, one of the things uh, that we want to test with the instrument is the so-called uh, direct uh, di digitization of the signal um, at the receiver. Uh, so there's already a technology that was developed uh, by the Max Planck Institute called the FSPEC direct digitization system that is currently being deployed at Effelsberg uh, and Mirkat, but has not been uh, tested with uh, you know, large uh, number, uh, large element uh, interferometer arrays. So if you do your uh, digitization at the, uh, when you receive the signal, that has some benefits. You have no signal loss, so you can send your signal um, to arbitrarily uh, long baselines. A calibration becomes both easier and more precise, and there are several additional benefits in doing that. Uh, it is, on the other hand, is more uh, challenging uh, technologically to, to achieve that. You have to find ways, for instance, to uh, distribute your, your observatory clock signal with sufficient precision to all your antennas, um, and so on and so forth. But in any case, this is something that we want to demonstrate and investigate uh, with Argus. Uh, again, another overview of this uh, uh, EDD uh, system uh, that uh, we currently have in mind. And uh, here, this concept here shows that the, uh, the, the, how the calibration can be done. And if you do this, uh, typically, you know, in uh, the radio observations, you observe a source 
and then you go off the source, you observe the sky, and then you go off the sky and observe uh, calibrator. Uh, and uh, when you observe the sky, you can also switch on a noise diode uh, within your signal chain, and that gives you the absolute calibration of the, of the signal. Now, if you do the, the uh, digitizing, the sampling, uh, as soon as you receive the signal, uh, you can actually, you, don't, you no longer have to switch on and off from, from the source, you can actually keep your uh, noise diode on all the time and you can subtract it uh, during the, the processing. And that can increase significantly by orders of magnitude the precision by which you can calibrate uh, the instrument. So big data and alerts, uh, this is also a very uh, interesting, both big data, uh, so Argos will both produce big data sets and big data, which are two different things. So, uh, but big data, you know, th there's some interesting uh, computing uh, challenges uh, related to handling all this data and delivering them uh, to the science community. So a lot of the effort will go into investigating this new uh, computing uh, technologies. And on the side, we want to also, you know, investigate uh, synergies with uh, the communities outside the uh, astronomy. For instance, some of the imaging techniques, uh, and actually some of them are pioneered by our um, uh, 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 CA colleagues uh, that participate in the project, uh, can also be applied to MRI imaging. Uh, there's this beamforming that obviously is uh, beamforming technology uh, that is driven by the demand in, uh, in radio astronomy that can also, you know, uh, be applied to telecommunications, remote sensing, uh, VLBI. We cannot do VLBI, unfortunately, with a, with a pathfinder because we don't have enough money for a precise enough clock. But eventually, you know, uh, we can do all this with, uh, 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 with a full array. So... Just to conclude my talk, how you can uh, get involved in the project. Uh, there are several ways, depending on your availability, your interest, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can start by visiting the Argos uh, website and follow the links therein. For instance, uh, by going here, you can sign up for a newsletter where you can you know, get spammed occasionally with news from the project. Uh, you can also participate in the science working group. Uh, so this is the group responsible for uh, developing the Argo science case and refining the science case um, uh, for the instrument. And if you want to do that, just uh, drop me an email. Uh, you can participate in the stakeholders workshop. I would be you know, very happy if, uh, we can uh, at least get a very good participation from, um, uh, from Greek institutes in the stakeholders workshop that will happen at some point uh, this year, uh, maybe in September, we'll see. Um, or uh, in addition, or alternatively, you, you can also uh, participate in the um, writing the science, uh, the white paper for Argos that will happen um, midway through the project. And also if you're looking for a job, if you're a master's student looking for a PhD or a, a doctoral student looking for a postdoc or a software engineer or a project manager, uh, we are looking for people right now. Uh, uh, fourth, we're currently looking for a project manager to postdocs uh, student. She is also looking for people. I believe also the Max Planck is, is also looking. So. Uh, just keep an eye or just send us an email and then um, we'll let you know uh, what is available. So I think I, uh, I will stop here. Uh, thank you for your patience and sorry for running a bit over time. Uh, Be fine. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, for this very interesting talk. And it was a very nice overview of the project, Argos. Um, I think that there will be some questions from the audience, especially from 
uh, people who are, who are working uh, with radio astronomy. But also feel free to raise your hand uh, or unmute yourselves and ask your question. Thank you, John, again. Thank you, Marianne, everyone. I see some clapping of hands, <laughs> virtual. <clears throat> uh, Professor Mastichiadis has a question. Yeah, not a question really, but I just wanted to congratulate you for your talk and for the whole concept. Uh, very, very interesting, even if 10 or 20% come out of what you have said, it will still will be an extremely interesting project. So uh, it is for how long do you, uh, um, you plan to have this? It's three years and then... So yeah, so, the, so we currently have funding for three years. So this is the funding that we got uh, is for this conceptual design study, uh, which is supposed to uh, conclude uh, with the construction of the Pathfinder and the critical design review. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the, yeah, the, the critical uh, design review. Okay. And obviously in the meantime, we we'll keep looking for additional funding. Um, no, but it's an extremely interesting concept to have this in spirit. And once again, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's actually uh, the, such an instrument is, is both. Uh, I, I, I would argue that this is actually not my concept. Uh, I would argue that this is, uh, you know, such an instrument is, is both necessary and uh, inevitable. And yeah. because it's clear that this is, uh, we have applied this to other wavelengths and it has led to very significant dis discoveries. And it's very clear that we need to do this. And, radio wavelengths as, uh, as well. For uh, FRBs, what are the expectations? Let's make a, a, a scientific question. Uh, what is, judging by, from the statistics of what we have seen, and uh, uh, how many do you expect to, to see? Is there an estimate? Um, so, okay. Uh, so, with uh, Pathfinder, so there are actually, let me say that there are, from the observational point of view, there are two different types of uh, FRBs. There are the so-called repeating FRBs. So these are FRBs uh, that go on and off, um, not in a periodic way, but um, you know they are repeating. And there are the one-offs as well. Uh, so with the Pathfinder, we'll be able to detect bears for most of the known repeating FRBs. And we will also be able to uh, discover of order one uh, new FRB uh, per month. Now, if the full scale instrument uh, were to be built, then we would detect hundreds of FRBs per, per day. Impressive. Okay. Thank you. Are there questions? Yeah, I would also like to ask something about the FRBs because you had a plot with where you were comparing Argos with uh, Chime, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, could you maybe go back? Yeah, let me try uh, to find the... Remember now. Did I have such a comparison? I don't... Um, uh, maybe it was the sensitivity or I, I don't remember. Ah, maybe, yeah, maybe it was the sensitivity, yeah. You mean this one? Yes, this one. Yeah, it was not exactly the sensitivity, I suppose, but... Uh, I noticed here that you are going to operate in a different frequency range compared to Chime. And yes, so maybe with, could you say a few more words about how you estimate <laughs> this number of FRBs that you are going to detect? Because 
I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I'm not sure how well we know the spectrum of these FRBs at higher frequencies. Uh, I know that time has detected several of them in that frequency range, but if you could say a few more words about it. Yeah, uh, I believe, uh, well, first of all, I think it's, it's very, the, um, the, spec, uh, the FRB spectral indexes are very, are basically all over the place. Uh, some of them are, but I would argue that a good fraction of them are relatively flat spectrum. So if they can be detected at time frequencies, they, then they can be detected at higher frequencies as well. Now, in addition to that, at higher frequencies, the propagation through the interstellar medium affects you. There's le you, you are affected less by the propagation in the interstellar medium. So you have less scattering and less dispersion measure. So that means that you can basically uh, uh, detect FRBs that are even further away or uh, embedded in more dense environments as well. So it's again, complementary. Uh, and just to answer one of the questions in the, in the chat as well by, by Calliope, I think this is also one of the main reasons why we, we chose this. So there are basically several reasons why we want to cover this frequency range. Uh, first of all, is for historical reasons. It's why uh, it's, you know, it's basically it covers the L band and the S band, which is most of the pulsar uh, science is being done historically. Uh, so we want to continue to do that uh, with Argos. Uh, we want to be able to follow up on the uh, SKA pulsar service, which will be conducted in the L band and S band. Uh, we want to be complementary to DSA 2000 uh, and time. We want to be less affected by the ISM compared to, to time to be able to probe uh, different phase space of FRBs uh, and, and pulsars. And also we want to be able to do this uh, at a low cost. And by doing anything above S band would require cooled receivers. And uh, if you have to cool your receivers, then um, that, that, is, uh, that is very expensive. Um, we cannot afford that. Okay, thank you. Yes, this was very interesting as well. Uh, um, now, having having said that, uh, the uh, the the exact frequency coverage of the instrument uh, is not uh, the, the the frequency coverage is, is not written in stone. I mean, uh, we still uh, it's not fully uh, defined yet. So, uh, if, if there's a reason, if you can come up with the reason, you know, why we want to, to go a bit lower or a bit higher, then, uh, then that's definitely something that we can investigate. Kayopi, uh, I think uh, this answered your question. Okay. Yeah, good. Um, until somebody else asks a question, I would also like to congratulate you for this effort because I think this is the perhaps the first time that we are going to have such a large scale uh, experiment, and it it involves a lot of technological concepts. And <clears throat> yeah, I think it's it's great uh, to have something like that uh, happening or being funded at least by Greece and also involving so many scientists from Greece. So yes, that's a, it's a big deal, I think. Well, at least it's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it, it's a fun project and everyone that is currently participating is greatly enjoying it. So please, I don't know, if, if you want to get involved, please, please do. And uh, we're very happy to, very open to collaborations and uh, Okay, thank you, John. Um, if I, let me check one more chat. It has a cool logo too. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> yes. It's a more <laughs> That's the first imaging uh, simulation. Um, 
It was inspired by <laughs> the gunshot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Uh... Okay, thank you very much. And I'm going to stop recording now the talk. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you.